ask God to bless our time. Gracious and loving God, what a privilege it is to gather together in this place. To be reminded of your faithfulness and to ask for your showers of blessing. The occasion calls for preaching, and I confess my dire need of you. I beg of you, Lord, to pour fresh oil on my head. Give me clarity of thought and precision of speech. Use me, please, as an instrument in your hand. And we who are gathered ask you for listening ears receptive hearts and ultimately responsive lives help us to leave better than we were when we came and so Lord would you please be pleased by the worship of our preaching and hearing this is what we're asking for in the wonderful and strong name of Jesus the Christ those who believed and agreed said amen and amen Allow me to say thank you to Pastor Brian Carter for this opportunity and privilege uh, to stand at this uh, historic and very helpful conference. Uh, and thank you to all of those who have made our time here uh, enriching. Uh, I am completely unqualified to stand up here, uh, but I'm up here anyhow, so pray with me, please. My assignment is the book of Acts chapter 1, uh, verse number 8. I've been assigned to address the mission, and I'd like to do my best to fulfill that sacred trust. Acts 1, verse 8, but if you permit me to back up to verse 6, to get a running start at the words of Jesus in verse 8. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I'd like to address that thing given to me, the mission, uh, the mission. Jesus has risen from the dead and spent some 40 days in counsel and preparation with the disciple company who are becoming the apostolic company. They are going from learners to practitioners to carry on, carry out the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the day of ascension. And in 10 days, Pentecost will happen and that will be the day of descension. But before Jesus goes up and the Holy Spirit comes down, we've got some questions. Will you at this time Restore the kingdom to Israel. I'd like to suggest that this is a very legitimate question. It's legitimate theologically because these disciples becoming apostles, these who are in process, have been engaging Jesus not just in the ministry of his works, but also in the ministry of his word. And they have seen Christ revealed 
in the prophetic works and per the Old Testament prophets, the coming of the Spirit in power has always been associated with the kingdom being manifested. I mean, if they read, heard, or understood Isaiah 32, 15 through 20, Ezekiel 39, 28 and 29, Joel 2, 28 through 3, 1, Zechariah 12, 8 through 10, whenever there's a mention of the power of the Spirit, it is immediately associated with the kingdom coming. And so when Jesus says, you're going to have the Spirit come to you, verse 5, baptize you not many days from now. They say, well, biblically speaking, we're anticipating that spirit and kingdom are the same event. It's a theologically legitimate question, and then it's a socially legitimate question. Because of the rampant and unending vicious oppression of Rome. And now their king has been crucified by their oppressor but has risen victoriously in defiance of Roman authority to assert his own. And he has already announced all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It's a legitimate question because we've been, we've been married, made to carry Roman packs for Roman miles. You've told us to go the extra mile. Are we done with that yet? It's a legitimate question. We were told if they slap us on one cheek to turn the other cheek, are we done with that yet? It's a, it's a legitimate question because the authorities in their lives are the antagonizers of their lives. And they're saying to Jesus, given your victorious resurrection and given the authority that you are claiming, can we now in this season of systematic oppression that keeps us from enjoying the fullness of creation as you originally intended. Is it time yet for the kingdom to come, for you to rule, for you to reign? Can, 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 we, can we be done with cops shooting unarmed black men? Can we be done with, with children being intentionally marginalized educationally so as to limit their opportunities at economic advancement? Can we be done with the gentrification of our neighborhoods historically so that they drive our property value down, move in, make it cool, and then make it too expensive for us to live there. Can we be done with unfair juries? Can we be done with the systematic imprisonment of young black men to feed the wealth of old white men? Can we be, is it time yet? I, 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 I think it's a legitimate question. And, and I'm talking about the mission. And Jesus then gives an answer. And his answer is the substance of our concentration today. It's one of the most prolific statements of purpose for the New Testament church. While venerated and celebrated by the church in modernity, it has somewhat lost its luster in post-modernity. His answer, his answer seems to have lost its luster, I believe, in many ways, because if we're honest, quite frankly, Jesus' answer is wholly dissatisfying and in many ways off-putting. His answer to people enduring significant suffering and those seeking theological clarity 
about the timing and ways of God is dissatisfying. Here's the simple truth of his answer to what is another form of the same old question, Lord, how long? Here's his answer. God has chosen to reveal the content of the kingdom while at the same time concealing the chronology of the kingdom. It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's, that seems to be a somewhat frustrating answer, my brothers and my sisters. It's frustrating because it means that this term fixed, it suggests that God has established a day, a moment, a time of manifestation of kingdom in its perfection and deliverance for all of those who are oppressed and your suffering doesn't make God rush. And, and, and it's frustrating then, it's frustrating. The tension of the mission is this, that we're called then to advance the kingdom by announcing the king and live in the difficult tension of living out the mission while learning to live with the dissatisfying answers of God to the legitimate questions of God's people. I don't know if this is playing yet. Let me say it another way. I'm saying that God says, I got the date, you do the duty. And if you do the duty, don't worry about the date. When the date comes, if you're found dutiful, your duty will meet with my date and you'll experience deliverance. That's so, so, so then what am I to do? What am I to do? What, what? What, what, what can the righteous do? What, what am I to do? <laughs> while, while, while I've got to live a missing, while I have dissatisfying, while I have dissatisfying answers, I, here, here, here's Jesus is, you shall, you, you, don't, you don't have to know, but you shall receive. <laughs> you shall receive. Verse 8, verse 8 is my assignment. You don't, you're, you're not going to know, but you shall receive. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to take I'd like to take the prism of verse 8 and, and, and hold it up to the light of, of, of our understanding and see if we can't see some refraction of the rainbow of God's truth for our lives. Here it is. It begins, the mission begins with an empowerment you shall receive. This, this, this is a futuristic, predictive uh, term, you shall receive it's it's predictive and it's promise you shall receive power power when the holy spirit has come upon you it's it's an empowerment that is that is that though you have to live with tension and frustration in in the working out of ministry please know i'm equipping you to be effective despite the frustration you, you shall receive Power, power, power is 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 the is the is the energy of God. The the energy of God. Power, power, and 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 really, really, we have a theological quandary because because chapter two is the manifestation of this promise in Pentecost. At Pentecost, they they receive the Holy Spirit in power. There is a dissension of spirit in in terms of manifestation, but 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 it, it can be theologically argued that they didn't receive the spirit at Pentecost. They had received him in John 20. Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. I, 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 I would suggest, my brothers and sisters, that, that it can be legitimately theologically argued that, that, that the spirit was in them. Uh, that's what happens when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ. There, there is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that seals an individual until the day of redemption. Spirit in is the earnest or the down payment for our salvation. Spirit 
end is, is, is being saved and assured that once rescued from the wrath of God by the grace of God through faith in the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross, one, once one has believed, the person can never be lost again. Spirit in means I'm going to heaven when I die. Spirit in means that one day in the sweet by and by when I stick my swords in the sands of time and study war no more I'll be able to read my title clear to mansions in the sky bid farewell to every tear and wipe my weeping eyes spirit in means that I'm gonna walk streets of gold and, and see big mama again and talk to granddaddy again spirit in means I'm going to heaven but what Jesus is talking about is not spirit in but spirit on Spirit in is the filling of, or, or is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but spirit on is the filling or the control of the Holy Spirit. Spirit in means I'm going to heaven. Spirit on means I can handle the hell that I've got to deal with on earth and work God's will out for my life. Spirit has come upon you it's an empowerment then it's an empowerment that that spirit in is permanent fixed immediate at the moment of conversion and 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 perpetual but spirit on is a moment by moment yielding the apostle paul will say it in ephesians 5 and 18 be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled Keep on being filled. Don't you see the refrain throughout the book of Acts? In, in chapter 2, they stood up and they were filled. Then, then Peter and John, after, after being sternly warned not to preach in the name of Jesus, once again, they were filled in chapter 4. Don't you see them again in chapter 8, my brothers and sisters, or chapter 7, when Stephen is getting ready to be tried and ultimately stoned for the blasphemous uh, concern that he raises that Jesus is God and the Son of God according to the Jewish law. Do you see them here? Do you see them standing, being filled with the Holy Spirit? Philip in his encounter with the eunuch and then in the city of Samaria where there's great joy that he's filled all over again at Cornelius' house when the gospel is proclaimed and they believe the Bible says they were filled again filling my brothers and spirit sister spirit upon you is when you yield at the moment where ministry is required and the power of God gives you an enablement beyond your personal giftedness beyond your education beyond your learning beyond what you heard but something on the inside gives you a power empowerment there there is an empowerment God's energy for your assignment there's an empowerment power is coming upon you powers the, the power when 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 the spirit that's in you gets upon you when you're at a place of yieldedness for the sake of the assignment that God has given you with the frustrations there's an empowerment that there's an empowerment but this empowerment leads to an embodiment listen to him listen listen can I turn the prism again that there, there it is you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. This, this, is, this is an embodiment. It is, it, is, it is the living out of an authentic identity. Listen. Now this presents a unique truth about the apostolic company who were personal eyewitnesses of the literal, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. They, they have the unique privilege of having been present at, around, near crucifixion and then to have Jesus seek them out on multiple occasions to give them concrete what Luke will call 
in the pretext of our text, infallible proofs that Jesus literally, physically rose from the dead. Paul would tell us in 1 Corinthians that Jesus shows up to Peter and, and the brethren and then to some 500 others at one time. And, 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 and Paul says, even to me as one born out of due time, those who were privileged to see the literal physical resurrection. Don't, don't you see him in that locked room telling, telling them, put your finger in the hole in my hand and your hand in the hole in my side. I want to give you proof beyond dispute so that when called to the stand of human conscience, you don't get up there with the inadmissible evidence of hearsay. You, you, have, you have a certainty based on lived experience. This is unique for the apostolic company. And the question then arises, how can we be witnesses of the resurrection if we have not been privileged to encounter the literal, physical, resurrected Christ. Now, I know some of y'all are deep and spooky. And some of you perhaps have seen the literal, physical, resurrected Christ. And God bless you, Apostle. We're grateful for your presence today. But there are others of us who will just be honest and say, we haven't seen him. But for those originals, he showed up literally and physically. But, but the good news for us is that what is unique to them in experiencing the literal physical resurrection of Jesus Christ does not eliminate us from being witnesses ourselves because Jesus showing up is not the only way he shows up. I wish I had some help just a minute here. I mean, some of you have been sick and know he can show up as a doctor in a sick room. Some, some of us have had to go to court and knows that he, he can show up as a lawyer in the courtroom. Ha, ha, has he ever shown? He, he will show up at whatever your authentic lived experience is. Here's the thing. As I talk to preachers and pastors today, completely unqualified to be here. Let me also say that our frustration Oftentimes in leadership in church, in trying to, in trying to encourage evangelistic, uh, 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 evangelistic movement in our people, is that we're trying to get them to do witnessing. But, but according to this text, we are not called to demand or require people to do an activity called witnessing. Rather, we are called to equip, the, to equip those who authentically embody an identity called witness. It's got to be who you are. Now, the privilege then of being a witness is that it requires first-hand experience, which means that God has sovereignly chosen to conspicuously act somewhere close enough to me that I meet the qualification inherent in the concept. It means I've had to see something experience something I've got to know it for myself and when I know it for myself witness 
is the authentic embodiment of who I am, not a part-time activity I participate in one Saturday out of the month. I am a witness. On, on my job with hellish co-workers, I am a witness. At the family reunion with millennials around me asking me, do I really still believe all the Bible? I am a witness. When, 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 when oppression uh, uh, attacks and, and uh, seems to press down the joy and liberty of my community, I am a witness. I've, I've seen him. I've felt him. I've encountered him. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I am his own. I am an embodiment. Let me, let me also say that this, this you will be. Is once again not command but predictive. He's not, he's not commanding you, he's he's identifying an identity in you. Can I turn it one more time? I'm done. That there's an empowerment, there's an embodiment, but then Jesus speaks very clearly. Of an expansion. Here it is. You'll be witnesses, my witnesses, personal witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's the expansion of the mission. There it is. You, you'll be my witnesses. You, you, will, you will authentically embody the reality that you have had an experience with me, empowered by my divine presence that is in you, coming upon you to be effective in your assignment, even with your frustrations and, and, and dissatisfied answers. And, and here's, here's, here's where it's going to happen. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, the, and to the end of the world. Well, I grew up uh, in the time where, where they told us Jerusalem was home. You started home. But Jerusalem is not home for these who Jesus is speaking to. Galilee, Capernaum, was home. Jerusalem is the last place you want to start talking about Jesus. They had just killed him. And one scholar says that Jerusalem is the most wicked city on the planet at this time. Because Jerusalem is a city where human wickedness is cloaked in divine revelation. It's where people live out their wrong under the cover of righteousness. And because Jesus pulled the covers off and exposed what true righteousness was both in his message and by his own authentic identity as the God man they had to get rid of him and Jerusalem is not the place you want to start Jerusalem is the last place you want to go but Jesus says I want you to take this power and live this identity in the last place you want to go. Because impact is necessary uh, or is most clear where it's most needed. Let me say it another way. I, uh, I, was, I, 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 I tried to be nice. I try to be sometimes nice to my wife and I bought her... Um, uh, a bracelet uh, that 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 was broken. Uh, it wasn't broken when I bought it, uh, but it got broken later. And bought a, a bracelet, got broken, took it to the jeweler to get it fixed. Uh, and the jeweler said, "This is a beautiful uh, piece of jewelry. It had become stale to me, mundane. I'd seen it several times, but but." But the jeweler took that bracelet after he had fixed it and cleaned it and laid it on some black velvet. Yeah. 
and the and the and the and the and the dullness because of the familiarity <laughs> ran away. I was again enamored and, and amazed by the beauty and the brightness of the bracelet, but I couldn't see how beautiful and shiny it was until it was laid on the black velvet. God says, my grace is a shining diamond. My, my, my love is a shining jewel. My, my compassion is a glorious and shining privilege. But sometimes you and I can get dull to the glory and the majesty and the privilege of what it means to be in relationship with the eternal God of the universe. And so he lays us in a Jerusalem where the black velvet of sin can cause the grace of God to shine a new and a fresh in our lives. Jerusalem. I, I want to tell you, I don't care how wicked it is, if it's Jerusalem, the gospel works there. But, but, but go on from Jerusalem then, Judea and Samaria. J Judea and Samaria are one regionally, but divided racially. Same place, but they think they're different people because of heritage differences. But the gospel works there in the midst of racial and religious division in Judea and Samaria, the one thing everybody needs is the grace and the mercy and forgiveness of God. And if you will tell them the good news of the gospel, the gospel works down through. But then to the end of the earth, specifically to the Gentiles, to those outside of the family, of natural Israel, symbolically to all humanity. And here's the good news, the gospel works there. <laughs> to people who have no God consciousness seemingly, their behavior suggests they have no interest, no concern with being saved. But take the gospel there because the gospel works there too. The, the gospel works there too. The gospel can save. Now this end of the earth is another point of tension and I'm through because that would include the oppressor. You just asked him, are you getting ready to deliver me from? But Jesus saves oppressors too. Thank you, Lord. Paul is going to live this reality out in his insistence to take the gospel to Rome. And when writing a letter from the Philippian jail, he says, greetings from the saints in Caesar's house, because God can say <laughs> the oppressor too. I'm through, but how to reach the masses. Men of every birth. For an answer, Jesus gave the key. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, mighty God, I'll draw uh, all men unto me. And all I'm trying to tell you is that the world is hungry. For, for the living bread. Hola. Lift the Savior up for men to see. Yeah, trust him and do not doubt the words he said. Draw all men 
hand unto me. I know we're preachers and we don't touch anybody, but I wish you'd shake somebody's hand and say the gospel still works. And so when you go home, just preach the gospel. Tell them he was born of a virgin. Tell them he walked around doing good. Tell them he lived a sinless life. He was tried in kangaroo courts, convicted of blasphemy and treason, that he was crucified on an old rugged cross. Tell them that he died until the sun refused to shine. He died until the earth rocked and reeled like a drunken man. He died until our sin debt was paid. He died until the rock split and the earth quaked and dead men walked around the streets of Jerusalem. He died until justice was satisfied. I wish you'd tell them that they took him down from the cross and buried him in the tomb. But thanks be unto God, that's not how the story ends. Because three days later, he rose with all power in his hand. I wish my grandma was here. She'd say, if the Lord needs somebody, Lord, I Yes, sir. Yeah. I ain't got no voice, but I'm going to try to holler just because I'm happy and because I'm here. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no.